like uh, that, that prayer, the serenity prayer, which I know many of you are very familiar with. That word serenity or peace. I don't know about you, but that's something that I, that I oftentimes find myself craving for. I wish I could just sit here in the moment and just not have any worries, not have any baggage I'm carrying around with me, not have other stuff that's constantly coming at me. Uh, I just want peace. And really, when we say we want, when, when I say I want peace, what I'm really saying is I'd like to be able to heal from some of the things I'm, I'm hanging on to, not letting go of, um, the hurts, the pains, the struggles, the deep wounds that have been inflicted maybe in the past or maybe presently dealing with. And, and that's really what the, the, that, that serenity prayer, I think, is really about, is God, help me to see myself as you see me. And... Accountability, I think, is a big part of this, and I'm going to help you see what I mean by this, because I'm going to kind of flip it on its head a little bit, because a lot of times I think, um, at least for me, when I hear the word accountability, I think of somebody just rebuking me and saying, I'm wrong, or, you know, you need to do this differently, you need to change your behavior, which is a part of it sometimes, but um, I'm going to be talking about it a little bit differently, because I think, because Personally, I know that I need accountability in all circumstances. And that's what I'm going to talk about. That, that there's many different types of sufferings in this world. And in all types of sufferings, I need accountability. And that's, that's the specific type of accountability I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll get to at the very end. So that's what I'm going to lead to. But first, I'm going to start with, with a type of accountability that uh, a lot of us might be more familiar with. Um, how many of you are familiar of the story of David, David and Bathsheba? Don't worry about it if you don't. I mean, I'm guessing a bunch of you are. Okay, um, not everybody. It's okay if you're if you're not. But the, the basic the basic story from the from the Bible is this: King, king David. He was a king in the Old Testament. And he he was he was he was very powerful. Obviously, he was king over a nation. And he, you know, because he was a king, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted to do. And he's sitting in his, on the balcony of his, of his palace. And he looks down and he sees a beautiful woman bathing. And what do you think that does to a guy? I mean, that, that's, you can use your imagination. He looks at her and he's like, I would like, that. I want her for my wife. And if you were a king back then, the idea was a lot of times that you could have multiple wives. You know, that was the type of culture they lived in. All right? And... And not correct, but that's the culture that they were in. They were in. Okay, so so what does David do? He does an incredibly, and, and this is a man who, who God, you know, who loved God. He seemed to have God at the center of his life. He was he's he's always seen as the greatest king in the Bible. All right, second to Jesus, of course. <laughs> but he's also a sinner. He's a broken person just like me and just like I believe everybody else is. And so what he did was he, he looked at her and he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I want. And so he took her. And he found out a few, some time later that she was pregnant. And guess what? Bathsheba's married. Okay, so now what? Well, King, King David doesn't want to look bad. So what does, he, what does he do? He first tries to convince her husband to go visit her while he's on leave from the army, okay? He comes back, go see your wife, go see your wife okay? Because maybe we can, you know, disguise this and they won't find out. Well, what turns out that, that Bathsheba's husband was a very honorable man. He said, no, I'm not going to leave the other troops while we're still fighting. Okay, so King David's like, all right, maybe if I get him drunk, then we can take care of this. So that's what he does. He gets, he gets, he gets Bathsheba's husband drunk. And he says, okay, go, go see your wife. Well, no, he's still too honorable of a man. He's still like, you know, I'm not leaving. And so David does the unthinkable. He calls the commander of his army and says, I want you to take Uriah, that was Bathsheba's husband, and he says, I want you to put him at the front of the, of the battle lines. So, and, and I want everybody to step back so that he'll be killed. That's how I'm going to solve the problem. Unbelievable, if you really think about it. That's exactly what happens. And what happens after that? Well, David marries Bathsheba. All turns out well for David, right? He got his way. He did everything it took to, to get his way, and it was horrible. But only David knows about it, right? Well, that leads to our reading, which is, comes from 2 Samuel. And what happens is God sends a prophet. Um, um, Scott was just talking about the prophet Isaiah. This is the prophet Nathan, okay? And he sends Nathan to David. And he came to him and said, and this is, what, this is the way God oftentimes works. He never, he doesn't all, always directly rebuke people. He uses stories to get people to like fess up to their, to their, to their mistakes. 
He, says there were, he went to David and he said this. He said, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, that's all he had, which he had bought. And he brought it up and grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. He took care of this. That's all he had. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flocks. He had all these, all these sheep, all of them, tons of them. He's unwilling to give this, this traveler from his flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So the rich man who had power took the one lamb from the poor man because he didn't want to give up any of the many that he had. All right? So David hears this story, and he's like thinking, this is a true story. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I made you king. God is king above all, and I made you king. And I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and all of Judah. I gave you all this stuff. It wasn't enough. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So first thing he says is your family, there's going to be lots of struggle in your family. And if you read the rest of the book of, of Samuel, second Samuel, you find out that David's kids had issues and they brought it right to his dad's front porch. You can read more to find out more about that, but it's, it gets ugly. It gets really ugly. But that's not all. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So he admits it. He confesses his sin. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. You're forgiven. Nevertheless, there are natural consequences. Because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. And he died. So what you have here is a story of, of David who did something completely wrong. Absolutely wrong. I don't think, I, it'd be hard to argue, you know, it, it, it was despicable, completely self-centered. I want what I want. I'm going to take it and I'm going to do anything it takes to get it, okay? God knows everything. And he said, because you did this, I have given you all this, there will be natural consequences because you've taken what I've not given to you, okay? And Nathan really was the person who came and, and held David accountable, okay? And spoke up and said, hey, You've been, you've, been, you've been a jerk. You need to wake up here and start realizing the blessings that God has given you and understand that the things that you've done, they will have natural consequences. So the question I have for you, though, put yourself in David's shoes. Okay, we know it's wrong, but I think I can tell you that myself, I've done plenty of wrong things in my life, plenty of bad choices, many things I'd love to take back. Do you, do you enjoy being held accountable for your actions? Do you like it when somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, I heard you did this, or I hear, hear you're, 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 you're doing this, or I, I, noticed, I noticed this behavior, and it tells me that you're thinking about doing this. <laughs> Any of you ever had that happen? Do you like it? I don't know. It depends. For me, it's kind of dependent on where I'm at sometimes. There have been times when I've appreciated it, and there's been other times where I've hated it. Today, my wife... It held me accountable. Um, I went to the toaster oven and I, I mentioned how, how, how dirty and nasty it was and she said, well, clean it. <laughs> and she was right. Because by me saying that, I was implying that she should have cleaned it. And, and, I, and if it, I can't expect her to just do it all, you know? So I'm not thinking of her, I'm not loving her, I'm loving myself more. You know, it's just take care of itself, right? Um, uh, dishes is another thing. Every, I love it. I, I actually appreciate this. When my wife goes to the other room and she says, when Megan goes, you know, uh, you know this, this dish did not find its way into the dishwasher, you know, or my clothes are on the floor. These are little things. But she's holding me accountable to, to having a bigger picture of, of the household. And I, and I need to have that. And she helps me to constantly have that in mind. And not just the dishes, but my children and other things beyond that. My, I, I would say that, that my wife is my greatest accountability partner in my life right now. 
and I and I greatly appreciate her for that, um, because to be honest, account and I think many of us would agree, I'm guessing that accountability is a good thing. It helps me to wake up to um, the reality. And if I don't, I don't think about this. For example, as a pastor, if I wouldn't point ask people why they weren't at church or why why didn't I see you at Genesis? I missed you guys. If I didn't do that. Would you not find more excuses not to come? I would. <laughs> if I didn't have somebody saying, hey, you know, we should probably do this because it would be good for us, you know? I probably should, should, should go to that Bible study. I should probably do that, you know? If I don't have somebody constantly saying, hey, you know what? This is, if you're, you're, you're starting to fall into bad habits. It's very likely that I'll find justifications for doing just that, falling into old habits, making bad choices. But what I wanted to, to help you see, though, is that that story of David really is just the tip of the suffering iceberg. There really are four types of suffering in the world. And what I described with David is one. It's the natural consequences of our actions in general. So I'm talking about healing, and we all want peace, and we all want healing from suffering, okay? And one type of suffering is number one, just what I described. Suffering that is brought on by ourselves. David made a bad choice. I say this to my children. You made a bad choice. And now this is what's going to happen. That's a bummer. <laughs> you know? That's what happens. I mean, and, and think about the things you've done in life that, that have just had that natural consequence. Because I did A, B is going to happen. And, and I've, as I've grown, as I've gone through life, I've learned more and more and more to see, okay, I did this. Oh, man. That's going to happen. <laughs> Because I know it. I can see it. I can see it. Just like, a, like a heading, head, heading towards a wall at 70 miles per hour. But that's not the only type of suffering that there is. There's other types as well. Number two, suffering of betrayal. This is when you actually do good things. Think about this. Suffering that happens when you actually do good things and people mistreat you because of that. Maybe you are holding somebody accountable and you're saying something that's true and you're seeking their greater good and what they do is they bite your head off or come after you. Paul's an example of this. He was a guy who lived to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with other people. And what did, it, what did that do? What, 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 was the natural, what happened because of that? He was beaten. He was flogged. He was thrown in prison. People mocked him. People ridiculed him. He had mobs of people trying to stone him. And all, all that stuff happened because he did the right thing. So, that's the type of suffering that oftentimes produces resentment. I don't know. And I'm, one of, I'm hoping that some of these maybe will, will hit you where you are today. So that's number two. Number three would be the suffering of loss. And these are the things that we just kind of know happen in life. It's going to happen. Death is an example of that. We kind of know that death is a part of things, even though we oftentimes try to ignore it. I, I mean, I, you know, a lot of times, I, I, some people I've noticed stay away from funerals because if you just ignore it, it's not, you know, it's, but, we, but deep down, everybody knows that death is an inevitability. In addition to that loss, loss of money, loss of possessions, those are things that we can oftentimes expect to happen in life just because this world's broken. All right? Mary and Martha are example of this. They lost, um, they lost their, their brother, Lazarus, in the New Testament. Okay? So the suffering, this is, this is the type of suffering that produces grief. Deep hurts. But oftentimes the most difficult of all of these is number four, the suffering of mystery. This is when suffering that is just unimaginable happens. Somebody gets cancer at the age of 40 and dies suddenly. Um, millions of people are taken to death camps and ruthlessly murdered. You know, um, a person suffering from cancer at the same time is dealing with financial issues, is dealing with family issues, is dealing with this and this and this and this and, and, and where do you even begin? Do you see what I'm saying? There are many different types of suffering and I know because I know many of you in this room I know that, that some of you have dealt with number one but I know that many of you who have dealt with number one have also dealt with other of those numbers. And I think a lot of times the suffering that we deal with in number one, sometimes, not all time, but sometimes is a natural consequence of dealing, a natural result of dealing with two, three, or four. You've, you've suffered deep hurts in your life. Maybe you're, you're, you, had, you had struggles with parents or with, with family and, and what, what it do, it caused you to, 
to make some bad choices later on that led to other problems. You know? And just trying to make sense of everything. The point I'm making here is not all suffering is directly tied to my bad choices. Um, and, and the problem I see in this world is that our society does a horrible job of teaching how to cope with it. The world that I see around us, and you can tell me if you disagree with this or not. You can tell me later. <laughs> but, not now. But, if, but what I see is a world that is very materialistic. When I live, as I live my life, as I look around, I see a world that says everything is all about stuff. And this is all there is. And, and the purpose of life is my happiness. And suffering, suffering is something that needs to be avoided at all costs. Because what it does is it takes away my happiness. It impedes what I, sh what I deserve to have. That's what culture tells me. I deserve to have happiness. But then when I have suffering, uh, the world tells me, well, uh, go get a therapist and he'll just tell you what to do. See? There's something that I need to do, okay? And, and, then, and then the reason why I see a lot of people struggling with suffering then is because, because I'm taught that I'm supposed to be able to handle everything myself. I can't understand how God fits in my equation because God is supposed to fit on my measuring stick. God is supposed to do what I want him to do. His plan is supposed to match my plan. Is, this suffering doesn't make sense to me, so it can't make sense to, that God can actually exist. Now think about what you're saying when you say that. that. You're saying that the creator of the universe, the person who, who put this all together, put this entire order of this world together, and died on a cross for me, doesn't know better than me. I would say that that's pushing things a bit. That's me talking. <laughs> But that's kind of what the world says. It says, well, it doesn't make sense to me. God has to make sense to me. His, the sufferings have to make sense to me. It has to be reconciled with God. And so, and so the answer is, is really accountability that has everything to do with what I do. I just talked about temptations moralized. Leads to this. So accountability, think about this. Accountability, as we think about it, while good, can easily become an exercise of focusing primarily on what either I or someone else is doing right, doing wrong, or needs to be doing. Don't get me wrong when I say this. I'm not saying that accountability is a bad thing. I'm saying that, that there's this temptation to view accountability and somebody holding me accountability, just like I talked about Megan, my wife. She was talking about things that I do, but sometimes there's this temptation to think that accountability is first and foremost about someone saying, rebuking me, and saying, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, and we apply that to every single situation of suffering. Okay? See where that leads? The end result... If, you're, if you believe in Christ, if you're a Christian, is, is, is a faith that is all about self-improvement. And God and Jesus really is nothing more than a tool to help me improve myself. Do you see what I'm, where I'm going here? The focus is on me and what I do rather than on what Jesus did. It says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. I know this might be hard. I'm going to explain this to you because it's kind of, it's, it's, it might be hard when you don't see the context. But Paul said this. He said, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law. So you who think that you, that you are right before God and everything can be right just by doing everything right. If you focus completely on what you do, you are, you're separating yourself from Jesus because you're focusing exclusively on your own works. You've fallen away from grace. That's not a grace-centered life. That's a life built entirely on me and what I do and what I should be doing and what I've done wrong. Do you see? It's, it's a life that, oh man, is, is, is depressing to me because I'll never, I'll never achieve what I want to achieve. Ever. Well, I do need someone to rebuke me from time to time. What I need most is someone to remind me who I belong to and the cost, and the cost that God was willing to, to pay, the, the price he was willing to pay so that I can say, yes, I am a screw-up. I, I am messed up. And things have happened to me that I, I just can't explain sometimes. Suffering hurts many issues in my life. But you know what? I look there 
and I see God's grace. I see forgiveness. I see a God who walks with me in my suffering through the fire, through the furnace, and promises to take me out the other side. I find, I, I started with that reading from 2 Samuel because I, I wanted to show you that in the Bible it talks about accountability just like we oftentimes think about it. But when you look at Paul, St. Paul who's, who wrote letters all throughout the New Testament, the main purpose of his letters were to remind people of who they were and what God had done for them. That's constant. That was the accountability he gave to all the people that would listen to him. Remember who God is. Remember what he has done for you. Remember what that means for you. It frees you and it gives you peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what he says. And so look at Romans 8.1, 8, for example. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Nobody condemn you, condemns you if you are in Christ. Through faith in Jesus, no one can condemn you for what you've done because it's over. The price has been paid. It's been nailed to the cross. That's not it. Turn to Romans 8.37. Well, you want to talk about other types of suffering. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We have conquered all these things and he list, goes, list on, lift, goes on to list because of Jesus. He says, I am sure that neither death nor life, <laughs> we are conquerors over death because of Christ death, nor life, nor the things that happen in this life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, the things I can't even foresee, nor powers, things that, that, that I, I perceive as having power over me in my life, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord, because I have conquered all those things because Jesus conquered it first. It's powerful stuff. And then you look in the book of Colossians. And the whole book, this whole letter that Paul wrote, the whole thing is about, hey, you're, you're, you people, he says, basically, he's talking to a church. You people, you're listening to what the world tells you. You're, 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 you're focusing so much on what you do. And you're forgetting about what Jesus has done. You're not focusing on his work. You're focusing on your own work. And, he's, and he, this, this whole letter culminates with him saying, seek not the things of this world, but instead look first. Set your eyes on things that are above. Set your eyes on Jesus, who has conquered death and who promises you a glorious future. And when you focus on him, it transforms you. And you, and you suddenly start to become what so frequently I try to become on my own. I only start to become what I want to be when I focus on his work rather than my own. It, it may not make sense to you, but trust me. It's my own experience in life. The more that I struggle, the more that I try to do right on my own, the more that I find myself screwing up and being disappointed. So this is my point. My greatest need is to look to Christ more than I look to myself. That's my greatest need. It's to constantly be looking to his work rather than what I'm doing. That's where it all starts. Everything flows from there. It all starts with that vertical relationship, the relationship of God coming to me, loving me. It all flows from there. A critical part of personal healing is to be held accountable to do this, to look to Jesus, to look at what he's done for me and all sorts of suffering and all sorts of hardship. I can be pointed to what he's done and I can be reminded no matter how wretched I am, no matter how how hurt I am, no matter how broken I am, no matter what's been done to me, I can know that I'm deeply loved. And I can, I can be, be at peace because Christ faced all of this for me. And he conquered it. All this really taps, if you're going through the steps, this really all kind of ties into step four, taking a personal inventory and, and a great way of really looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, what, in what ways am I doing this? In what ways am I relying more upon myself than God, than Jesus? It's really by, by asking this question, saying, what am I looking to for security and purpose in life instead of Jesus? It's a great place to start. Write it down. And remember that, that, that Jesus offers so much more than all those things. When I talked about at the beginning that my greatest accountability partner really is my wife, and I, I would encourage all of you to find a person that you can, you can look to as an accountability partner, not only in your actions, but I would say most importantly in your faith. Um, is this, is, is somebody that's going to point you to, the, to Jesus. And my wife does that for me all the time. 
That's, I, that's, that's, that's how our marriage works. That's how it works. That's the magic trick, <laughs> you know? I, I do hurtful things to my wife. She hurts me sometimes. But you know what? I know that she's, a, she's broken just as I am. I know that Jesus forgives her, and I know that Jesus has forgiven me for unbelievable things, and so I'm called to forgive her. And a reminder of the forgiveness Jesus offers her, and she does that to me. But I ha don't just have my wife. I have family. I have friends. I have people here at Genesis who do that for me. I have people, um, random people I run into who remind me of, of these things that I need to hear. And, and that's, I guess that would be my great encouragement for you. Do you have somebody in your life who's not just saying, hey, you probably should be doing this better. You should be doing this differently. Some, but do you have somebody in your life that says, you know what? Are you looking to Jesus? What he's done? Are you remembering that, that no matter how frustrated you are with your life right now, Jesus says that you are loved. You are valued. You have purpose in life regardless of what you've done because of what he's done. Do you know that no matter what you're scared of, what you're afraid of in the future, Jesus promises you amazing things that surpass anything you can have in this world. If you don't have somebody like that, I encourage you to, to seek someone like that. And, and, and that's why a community like Genesis is so important. And that's why our table time at the end connect. I always try to throw in a question that has to do with how we identify with Jesus because I don't want you guys to just focus so much on what you're doing wrong. All those things. I also want you to focus on what Jesus has done for you because that's where the healing begins.